Boy Scouts had a lot to do with it. You were taught in our area, and Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, you were taken in carpools, and Hilda's father actually worked in the scouting community as well. They took people to these trees and explained them. Unfortunately, all but about two are gone out of those 37 of those trails. And I'm proud that our community at least put a fence around it. So and am I. Ironic, so are you. Uh, yeah, and, and there should be a, a commemorative plaque, and maybe there was one. And uh, so I'm going to look into that. And a lot of times there were plaques, and I, the reason I say that with certainty is because of what I spent my life doing. Sometimes we found the plaques from trees in historical societies. They tried to protect them with kids and maybe wreck the stand that the plaque was on. So rather than lose the plaque, here I, I find the plaque in the basement, perfectly preserved bronze plaque stating what year they did it, you know, who did it, what, what group, you know, whether it's a Daughters of the American Revolution group protected a lot of the trees, uh, different historical societies paid for the plaques, had several members of several tribes come down to ceremony got the photographic evidence of all of them together. That's the cool part. They all liked it, everybody liked it. In Traverse City, there's a, a series of uh, Indian trail markers, and then the Washington Street uh, tree does have a, a plaque and a, a stone near it. Uh, the one that says it's marking a path towards Mackinac? I believe that's the last statement in that plaque. Okay. That, again, is important to me, and when I was up there last time, I wasn't aware that that plaque or that tree was still alive. Uh, because of what I was doing, I believe it was uh, Joan Oiko sent me the photo of that. It's in the book. But again, it ties back to Hilda's father, Raymond Jansen. He mentions the fact that the, tri that the trail marker trees were up in Mackinac and on that plaque. He's talking about that particular leaf-shaped tree it's dissimilar to this. Yes, very much so. It's a radical bend in the tree. Every time those, those trees appear within a mile or two of all the traditional trail marker trees in the Great Lakes states that I've been to so far. So it's not random. And it's specifically pointed out in uh, monthly, monthly scientific by Jansen, the design and the purpose of that line, that it was to denote trail diversion. It's like a language in the trees. Different shapes meant different things. So when, it, when something like that reoccurs, not just once, not twice, not three times, four times, five times, same you know, age group for the trees, same area, always an area of heavy Indian population, great real estate, which is, which is what you guys have here. Uh, to me, that's important. Again, it's, it, it's not happenstance when the same thing is happening over again, over again, in the same areas all around the Great Lakes. But a plaque would be absolutely wonderful here. So everyone, this is uh, Dennis Downs. He's a uh, publisher of a, a book and spent 30 years uh, researching uh, trail market trees. Uh, this is Helga. She's known as Little Fawn. She's uh, Chief Thundercloud's daughter. Um, in this photo, that shows uh, Chief Thundercloud. And uh, we're just very honored that you guys took the time to visit our community and, um, and spend some time with our tree and educated us. I and we're aware of that. But what we're concerned with together is reconnecting with not just this, but all the known trees that the two of them would have had the ability to be at together. That's something. That's real history. We appreciate you taking the time. We appreciate you sir. What kind of minerals? Salt? Exposed copper, flint, chert, salt. salt licks they mentioned leading out to. Things that, you know, everyone says that, you know, they could follow the buffalo traces. Well, that's fine, but I don't know if you guys have met a buffalo lately that needs copper. Uh, I haven't. It, it's, it's incredibly necessary to mark things that human beings would need. Medicinal plants that don't grow but in one certain area. 
So that that's the importance. Yeah, there's this one area. I met a teacher who told me he had property and he had a salt brine on it. And then I find out it's around Boone, Michigan, and then you find all the characteristics and there were these trench circular enclosures. And, and so I wonder if maybe they weren't there because of the salt and the mineral as well as the maple, maple syrup and stuff. They're out in the woods. You would always want to gather things like this. Whenever you went on a major trip, your goal, they didn't have Home Depot. So when you went on a major trip where you're walking, this nonsense of the cowboy movies where everybody's on horseback, not happening. You were walking the majority of the time. You would want to know how to get to the things you needed to bring back home for the winter months and the things of necessity in the quickest, fastest, smartest means. Not looking around. A lot of times you wanted to move, move through territories that weren't your own. So your, your grandfather might have said, okay, son, when you see this, this gets you to what we need, get out of there. It's, uh, it can't be overstated that animal paths couldn't answer all the needs that they needed. And it, fresh water was a big thing. Everyone goes, oh, they just drank out of the edge of the lake. If you've ever been living on a lake, you know you don't want to drink off the edge of a lake. You don't want to drink out of a river when it's warm. You want to know where fresh water springs are all along your trail. Dennis, um, the artesian well waters of Traverse City is why the state hospital located here, so you just you never know what the Ottawa and uh, the Anishinaabe may have known. And we know that a lot of these were located around natural springs. I actually learned that from Charlie Wirtz. I was probably maybe 30-something, and Charlie was about 92. He lived in Antioch. He was a third-generation well driller. And through the grapevine, he had found out what this young guy from the community was doing. He's like, are you the boy that disappears and then comes back two months later you know, and, and talks about these things? He actually made me some hand-drawn maps to where trail market trees were located near freshwater springs. And again, it's not something every family knew about. And a lot of times with, I'm sorry to tell you, with some historians, they get a little upset that, how come we didn't know everything about it? Well, if I belonged to your tribe, I wouldn't be telling everybody about it. Uh, sure, everybody didn't tell everybody. It's kind of an advantage to know the most clever way to get around and gather supplies and find fresh water. The shortest routes during a flood. You want to know where those ridge runs are during floods. And you want to know where that low, short, fast route is during the good, good weather. A simple marker taught to all of us by our forefathers would tell us that. Okay, this is where we diverge. Otherwise, we're going to walk another mile and we're not going to be able to get through. We leave now, we can go up, we'll go around, we'll be on the other side of the flood. Before they had the divergence of metal plows and equipment to drain wetland areas, areas in Indiana, Illinois, parts of Michigan were flooded the majority of the year. Maybe August was when you would travel. And I don't think people could grasp that in modern times. Again, thanks to everyone for showing up. I really appreciate it. Thank you.